Arkansas's National Guard armories had most of the component parts in inventory from which to build guns. All that was lacking was to enlist the manufacturing services of a small clandestine group of trusted Arkansas manufacturing companies, and the recipe would be complete. They would build the critical gun parts that, by law, produce a paper trail from the manufacturer to the end user. Only in this case, per CIA instructions, there would be no serial number stamped into the parts and no documentation created to leave an embarrassing trail. Untraceable weapons would seemingly appear from nowhere and Barry Seal would then fly the munitions to staging areas in Central America with the help of his CIA provided C-123 cargo plane, the Fat Lady, which had a gross weight capability of 60,000 pounds. Second, the Contras needed skilled pilots, pilots trained in the risky and often deadly business of flying slow and heavily laden cargo planes behind enemy lines for the purpose of resupplying the Contra soldiers on the ground in Nicaragua. As we had learned in Vietnam, guerrilla warfare depends upon a continuous supply of munitions, medical supplies, and food being provided to the foot soldier on the ground. The CIA's Enterprise, based in Honduras, had already procured the planes, planes such as the C-123 Provider and the C-7 Caribou. But potentially catastrophic risks were being taken by piloting the planes with American crews. If an accident or a shootdown did occur, the CIA would have built-in deniability if the planes were piloted by Nicaraguan nationals who were simply trying to liberate their country from the jaws of communism. Being an FAA certified flight instructor, Terry Reed's role with respect to the Contra pilot training was to train the students in multi-engine low-level operations, giving special emphasis to aerial cargo delivery techniques at night while in hostile fire environments. Third, SEAL was tasked with flying the necessary cash back to Arkansas to sustain the operation. All of the sources of SEAL's cash are not yet known. However, a large amount has been traced to the Drug Enforcement Administration in Florida. It appears the DEA was funding the MENA operation with cash seized during drug raids. Were there Contras who relied on the profits of narcotics in order to buy arms and to survive? Yes. It is easy to see how the entire MENA enterprise could evolve into ex-CIA Director Bill Casey's mandate to develop an off-the-shelf self-sustaining, standalone entity that could perform certain activities on behalf of the United States. But what developed as a result of Barry Seal building the machinery to launder unauthorized government money will likely emerge as a money laundering scandal, the likes of which this country has never seen. Back in the summer of 1987, a young television journalist named Teresa Dickey was covering Western Arkansas for Channel 5 out of Fort Smith, a city located 100 miles north of Mena. Well, Miss Dickey had discovered something very strange indeed was, or had been, going on in and around the Mena airport. Years earlier, the townspeople of Mena had welcomed with open arms and much fanfare the arrival of huge military C-130 aircraft. This was perceived as a boom for the rural Mena economy. Little did the townspeople realize, the Central Intelligence Agency had just selected MENA as the staging area for an unauthorized clandestine operation. Initially, Dickey thought that perhaps she was witnessing the results of then-Governor Bill Clinton's aggressive industry recruitment program, a recruitment program designed to drag Arkansas beyond its hillbilly, corncob pipe, and moonshine image by luring out-of-state businesses into Arkansas through promises of state-backed low-interest loans, nearly free land and buildings, coupled with huge tax incentives. Jobs for Arkansans was the young governor's pledge, and Dickey, at first, thought maybe Clinton's plan was working. Bill Clinton's industry recruitment plan had worked all right. Its purpose was to attract industry. But what it had attracted and recruited was the CIA, and along with it, covert operations which had been banned by the United States Congress. But what was peculiar about the MENA airport was the level of sophistication found in all sorts of aircraft maintenance operations situated alongside MENA's single north-south runway. Not to mention that remote MENA 
was the home of only 5,000 people. High-tech aircraft overhaul facilities located deep in a densely wooded region of the Washita mountain range. Businesses drawing from a labor pool not normally associated with skilled technicians. Well, all of this made Dickie suspicious. So what had Dickie found in that isolated little burg known as Mina, Arkansas? A town with no four-lane highway access. A town where everyone either knew each other or was related. A town that was harboring a deep, dark secret. The aftermath of a large-scale CIA-like operation that was soon to have a very bright light shown upon it. What had triggered Dickey's suspicion was the extensive security barring access to the airport, as well as the presence of a sea of very large airplanes. Airplanes bearing new paint jobs, foreign registrations, and markings from cities situated long distances from tiny Mina. This prompted her to interview a series of individuals who owned or operated aircraft modification and overhaul facilities at the Mina airport. Dickey focused immediately on why the need for such elaborate security, which included the use of employee ID badges. George Reeb, the owner of a shop that had retrofitted CIA aircraft, responded as follows. Well, you have to tighten up security whenever you're around aircraft because of the uh, safety factor. And I think it's a good idea because, you know, since we're growing so fast, a lot of times you're not familiar with all your employees and to have badges you can distinguish who's an employee and who's an employee for another company on the field versus just someone coming in to look around and you can't quite have that when asked why he had relocated to Mina from Maryland Reeb responded well I worked for Fokker aircraft at the time and was handling used aircraft and one of the customers told me about Mina, Arkansas, to have aircraft refurbished, and I'd never heard of Mina, Arkansas before. Dickey inquired about Mina's customer base, and Reeb provided. Had an airplane last week leave for Australia. One, two weeks prior to that to Australia. We have two more coming that are going to Australia. We send uh, aircraft to Europe, uh, all over the world. Reeb's response about refurbishing aircraft from as far away as Australia should have alerted Dickey that something was amiss. The operating cost to fly a large airplane from Australia to Mina would far exceed any savings realized by having work performed in rural Arkansas. Dickey was then able to penetrate the security of Rich Mountain Aviation, the CIA's primary facility at Mina, the very one that had been used by Barry Seal's organization. Dickey was able to film both Fred Hampton Jr. and Joseph Neville Evans, Seal's trusted mechanics, both of whom were assets of the CIA and DEA. Dickey then interviewed Fred Hampton, and again, the discussion centered on the need for elaborate security. Well, the security fence, well, that was something we put up probably about uh, two or three weeks ago. We put it up in anticipation of our first uh, inspection by the military. Being that these are their aircraft and they are used as part of this uh, missile defense system in the Marshall Islands. This was obviously a cover story. Dickey would later discover that office employees of Rich Mountain had been asked to believe concocted cover stories as well. This went as far as one secretary being told that one of Barry Seal's planes had been modified to haul porpoises. Dickey's suspicions solidified into reality a few months later. Through the Iran-Contra hearings in Washington, a connection had been made between the Contras and the MENA operation. This prompted Dickey to dig back into the history of the government's clandestine involvement with Rich Mountain Aviation, a company that was surfacing as one that had performed strange modifications to CIA aircraft. A central figure was also emerging, a man named... Adler Berryman Seal. This is Barry Seal, a highly publicized drug smuggler originally operating out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Since 1978, he carried out one of the largest drug smuggling operations between the United States and Central America. 
In the spring of 1982, Louisiana State Police warned Seal that they would tail him wherever he went in efforts to stop his operation. It's believed that Seal decided to move his 